Today's scripture comes to us from the book of Hebrews in the 11th chapter. And I'm going to start with verse 29. Listen for the word of God. By faith, the people passed through the Red Sea as if it were dry land. But when the Egyptians attempted to do so, they were drowned. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell after they had been encircled for seven days. By faith, Rahab the prostitute did not perish with those who were disobedient because she had received the spies in peace. And what more should I say? For time would fail me to tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, and David and Samuel and the prophets, and through faith, who through faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice, obtained promises, shut the mouths of lions, quenched the raging fires, escaped the edge of the sword, won strength out of weaknesses, became mighty in war, put foreign armies to flight. Women received their dead by resurrection. Others were tortured, refusing to accept release in order to obtain a better resurrection. Others suffered mocking and flogging and even chains and imprisonment. They were stoned to death. They were sown in two, or sawed in two, and were killed by the sword. They went about in skins of sheep and goats, destitute, persecuted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and mountains and in caves and holes in the ground. Yet all of these, though they were commended, uh, commended for their faith, did not receive what was promised since God had provided something better so that they would not, apart from us, be made perfect. Therefore, and I just have to warn you, in Scripture, if there's a therefore, you best pay attention to what it's there for. That's the way I read this Scripture. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses... Let us also lay aside every weight and the sin that clings so closely and let us run with perseverance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, who for the sake of the joy that was set before him endured the cross, disregarding its shame, and was, has taken his seat at the right hand of the throne of God. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So this morning we're looking at this great story about faith. And uh, the author of Hebrews relates it, at the end at least, to a race. It's a race uh, that we're running. And uh, I know to look at me now, y'all are probably going to laugh, but believe it or not, I actually ran track uh, in my younger days. And uh, I'll have to tell you, we did some stupid stuff, uh, and I did stupid stuff at the direction of some coaches at South Houston High School. Uh, how many else of you have done anything stupid at the direction of a coach? <laughs> oh, yeah. It's not all that uncommon, right? Uh, the coaches all believe they had the best way to do anything and, and taught us. And So the stupid thing we did is I was a distance runner, and we ran with ankle weights on with the idea that we would become stronger. But what we found out is that your feet take enough pounding as it is without putting more weight on it and on your ankles. And so a lot of us ended up having ankle problems or this, that, and the other thing. But here was the theory behind that, and it made a perfect illustration for this particular scripture. You see, you ran with weight on, but on the day of the race, you took all that off. You didn't wear your warm-ups anymore. You didn't wear those weights anymore. You wore the smallest little T-top kind of a, a track shirt with shorts. And you're, how many of y'all ran track and remember those old track shoes back in the day that were literally just a thin piece of leather with some cleats attached to the bottom of it because we ran on cinder tracks and... You know, that gave us a little traction, but the, the shoes we wore to run practice in 
were probably three times as heavy as our track shoes we ran on track day, on the, on the day we went to a track meet, right? And so we get this illustration that this author gives to the Hebrews uh, people that when you go to run a race, you take off all the encumbrances. And you run a race that is, as best you can, unencumbered, right? That's the theme of this story. But I have to say that as I looked at this this week, I really got kind of intrigued by the idea of what faith is. This race that we're supposed to be running and winning and doing everything we can to be unencumbered so that we can do it right And in this passage, the author tells the Hebrews, and he talks a great deal about the faith of all these people. In fact, the parts of chapter 11 that I didn't read would have told you about Abraham and a long story about Abraham. And then we would have heard about Moses and another long story about Moses. And then he kind of concludes with this message that talks about all of these people. Uh, that he names three, and then he goes, oh, and it would take me too long to talk to about blah, 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 and all these other seven people that he names, right? But, and, but he, he, he gives us this idea that faith has come down to us throughout the history of all of this. But really, what is faith? I mean, how do we define faith? Uh, and I will tell you that our, our, uh, our culture boundaries about that word a bit. Um, you know, you might remember that uh, George Michael, uh, does anybody know who George Michael was? Anybody? Yes, surely we have some George Michael fans in here somewhere, right? And he, one of his most famous songs was, you got to have faith. you got to have faith. All right? But obviously that was a worldly faith because that didn't work so out so well for George Michael, you know? And so we learn that although people talk about faith, they may not quite really understand what we as Christians hope to understand about what faith is. All right? So I'm going to tell you another little story about a practice that I have, and that is, and I consider it a spiritual practice, and that is that every week I will find something to read that is written by somebody I disagree with. Okay? Okay? That's just part of what I do. Uh, I find peer-reviewed articles in different places, or I might find a book that's been published by a reputable publisher, and I'll read something by somebody who I just typically disagree with. Now, I've got to tell you, I wish more people had that practice. I'm not saying that I'm doing anything marvelous, but I'm going to tell you, in today's world, I don't think anybody even wants to listen to anybody they disagree with, much less read something they've written. And really understand. But here's what I do when I read that. Whenever, it is my goal, (laughs) I will tell you, but I'm a human as you are. It is my goal to go into that reading saying they could be right. They could be right. Even though they completely disagree with me, they could be right, right? And and so I, I, I would encourage all kinds of folks. I mean, I, I wish I could talk to Congress and say, I wish you would read what the other people are saying and say, you know, they could be right. Because what they're doing is not that. And you know that, right? That's why we're kind of in the mess we are in some places. We just disagree, and if we disagree, you call them names, and you, you, you don't, you know, listen to anything they have to say. But I read this week a chapter in a guy I typically disagree with. And I read a chapter in a book that he has out there that is called The Heart of Christianity. And the reason I read this chapter is that he has a whole chapter that is entitled Faith, the Way of the Heart. And he talks about faith as not so much even believing as it is in sort of living into something okay and the way he did this and the way I guess I really appreciate it more uh, is that he does it by uh, explaining to us that scripture uses four different words that are now translated into faith in most English translations 
There's four different words. You think the, you think the Bible is difficult to understand? Think about that. There are four words that have four completely different meanings that when you read them in Scripture, they just say faith. <laughs> and then it's up to you to interpret what you think faith is, right? Uh, not necessarily go back and look at that. But um, what, I, I, what he does in this chapter is, y'all, y'all know those things where, uh, and, and I think they do still do this some on the Tonight Show where they have like a reporter on the street they're trying to get the word on the street. This is, you know, here's how, what people think, Right? And what he does is he starts this chapter off by saying, here's what I do, here's what I did, and that is I went and asked people, ordinary people, what is faith? And he said 90% of them come back with something that ties faith with belief. But most of them stay completely in the head. They say they believe statement that they read but they don't internalize it does that make sense he said for instance a christian might say i believe in god i think that you know god had something to do with scripture and i believe that jesus christ was the son of god and he said if you believed all those things most people would call you a christian and say you have faith but he says in all actuality there's mo- some people will take that a lot deeper and actually require you to have a lot more things if you're going to be called a believer. But the truth is that this faith has other dimensions. All right? And so I want to kind of sum that up for you a little bit by talking to you about the four words that he says are translated into English as faith. Right? And the first one is, uh, the the first Latin word is... uh, Ascentius, Ascentius is translated as faith. And that word most closely probably in English is an ascent. Where, you know, y'all know what ascent, where you have a, a, a statement of belief or whatever. And he says that what that word connotated in the Latin was simply that you read it and you understood the words. Okay? You, you had an understanding of the words. So faith was an ascent to something that you could describe. And actually, most of our creeds are kind of built around that, right? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. Jesus Christ is only Son, our Lord. Those are words. And you can have an ascent to those words, meaning you agree with the words, right? But he says that really is simply head. Simply head knowledge, okay? And he said, that doesn't really get us to the place we need to be when we're talking about faith in Christianity. He said, the second word that, is, uh, that comes up in the Latin that has been translated into English as faith is fiducia. Anybody want to take a guess at what that kind of roughly means in English? Fiduciary, right? Y'all know the word fiduciary, right? Fiduciary is what bankers do they they have a fiduciary duty to keep our money where it's supposed to be and others have fiduciary duties right to do what they and fiduciary certainly kind of means this idea that on top of just the head knowledge you're now believe moving somewhere into a place of trust that you trust what you have read you see okay so do y'all get it so far? We've, we've just read it, and we just taken it in, and we said, okay, I believe that. And now we are beginning to trust it with fiduciary. And fiduciary means to trust. And, and one way that one of the writers explained this was this. He said, faith, a, a fiducia, faith is as trust like floating in a deep ocean. If you struggle and you grow tense, and you, thash, and you thrash around, you will eventually sink. But if you relax and trust, then you will float. Now, how many of you guys, or anybody, girls, or, or all ever were in scouts or anything like that? You know, brownies and Girl Scouts. And I know in, in my scouting career, I'm an Eagle Scout. Y'all hear that for the next ever how long I'm here. I'm an Eagle Scout, and um, I actually taught life-saving quite a bit. 
And one of the things we learned was that you can take off your blue jeans if you're in an emergency situation, tie little knots in the end of them, and blow them up, and you can literally float on your blue jeans for more than 30 minutes. All right? But you know what you got to do to be able to do that? You just got to lay there, very trusting in your blue jeans, and hoping they're not the new kind that have holes all in them. <laughs> um, but, you know, you, you, you have to trust that that blue jean is going to do what they've taught it will do, and that is hold enough air to keep you afloat. And if, you know, and then 30 minutes later, you can scoop some more air in there or whatever. But it's a very gentle trusting thing that's what the second word in latin would have to kind of mean to us that we just relax into it because we trust that faith all right the third word um, is a word that uh, and, it, and it's pronounced in latin philodetus which comes from fidelity Okay, are the same root as the word fidelity, or uh, you know anything that has something along the idea of fidelity, and what what fidelity really sort of means is loyalty. That's how we kind of now move. So we've moved our faith from being just some head knowledge where we read some words and we say I believe that, to actually trusting it in kind of a way where we can relax into it and trust it. Now to where we're going to have a loyalty now surrounding that faith. And what does a loyal faith sound like or do? What it, what it means is um, an allegiance or a commitment to doing those things that faith has called us to do. And I think this is where we get the illustration that the author of Hebrew gives us with all these people. Okay? Okay. You see, they're at least at that level, right? Because they've moved past the head knowledge. They've moved even past the trust. And now they're going to be completely loyal to doing what God has called them to do. And they're going to step out and do things that most people won't do. You see, they're going to, when somebody says, march around a city for seven times and then shout and the walls will fall down. You know, I'll bet there were people around that said, I don't really trust that. And they didn't experience the victory that those who trusted and were loyal did, right? And so there's this idea of a faithfulness to a way of God. And I've got to tell you, I, I wasn't here, but I know of you. I know of what you did after Harvey, where you opened your doors and people came into this place. And you did that because you trusted and you were loyal to being what God needed you to be at that moment at that time. Do y'all agree with that? I'll bet there's some people that came in this church that y'all were not all that comfortable with during that time. I, I don't know who was here and who saw the people. I know what I've experienced when I've done things like that. And that is, not everybody who comes through the door looks like you, thinks like you, or even smells like you. But in faith, because you had thought about it, you had begun to trust it, then you went and you were loyal to it. You did then when God called you to do what you were asked to do. And you see, for me, that's what the cloud of witnesses is about. Because that's what those folks did. And then the last word that Borg uses uh, is visio. Anybody want to guess what that one is related to? Vision, right? Because now your faith has moved from thinking about it and, th and, and mentally believing it to trusting it to being loyal to it to now have a vision of what it exactly is that God has called you into, that God has called this place into. Now, I will tell you that part of what I have done, I, I've done a VCI in another church, and then I worked on the conference level with VCI, Vibrant Church Initiative. And um, part of what we hope to do 
is get the clear vision of exactly where God needs us to be at this moment, okay? And, and I got to tell you, I think most of you sitting here would agree that we are not exactly where we think we ought to be, much less where God thinks we ought to be. Do you agree with that? Are y'all happy with the number of people that are here? <laughs> are you happy with the, what has happened? I mean, I, I'm not saying this church hadn't done wonderful things, and, is, you know, and, and I'm not saying that there's not this, this great cloud of witnesses that stand behind this place, this building, but what I'm saying is that God continues to have a vision for us, and we need to join into that vision. And if that vision is to fill up this place on a Sunday morning, I'm not sure that it will be. But if that's part of the vision that God has for us, I want to be in, I want to be in on it. I want to be a part of it, and I hope you do too. And, and the truth is that the vision is that um, as hostile and threatening as change may seem to be what is so important is this cloud of witnesses you see i think that most people and i've i've studied that passage a lot of times and talked about it in different places um, we're going to talk about doing disciple bible study here at the church sometime soon and and i've led disciple bible study one eight times and that's because my wife says i'm remedial uh and I can't get past one because there's four of them, you know. And I've done one eight times, and I've only, I did three one time. And she says, well, that's just because, they like, know you can't get any further past that. She's done all four of them. And, uh, but w when I read that scripture with, with folks around a table who are trying to actually hear what God is saying for us, I, most of the time they start off believing that, that reference to a cloud of witnesses is referring to some kind of superheroes. You know, somebody we would um, relate to the, the superheroes we see in so many films today, that they were supernatural, that things like that used to happen in the church. Things God used to use people that way, that God, you know, has gone a different direction now. But when I read that scripture, what I know from reading it in the Greek and from reading it in other places is that what he is saying, the, the author of Hebrews is saying is, these are ordinary people doing extraordinary things because they were solid on all four of those levels of faith. You see what I mean? So now you've got a crowd of witnesses who aren't just the cheerleaders who were superheroes, they're people just like you who say, you know, if God calls us, I don't know what God's going to call us to do, but if God calls us to, you know, rip up all the, the pews and the carpet and, you know, paint the floor purple because people like purple, then those people would say, he asked me to do something stupid too. And I did it. And my name's in the Bible. I mean, Rahab, who trusted her? God. You know, she's in the Bible a couple places because she's in the Bible about her story, and now she's over here on Hebrews where this guy's calling out people of great faith. You see? So all I'm really saying is that this faith thing is huge. We simply have got to move into the place where we don't think of faith as reciting on Sunday morning the Apostles' Creed. We, don't even, we need to even move past the fact that we can relax in God's arms. And, and I try, you know, there are times when I want to relax in God's arm and trust exactly that I'm right where he wants to be and I can just relax. And sometimes when I'm singing in the choir, it, that does that for me. Uh, but he also wants us to move past that and maybe even pick up a word from some of our friends that say simplify. That's that same root word of fidelity, which is now you're going to be absolutely loyal. And finally, 
you're going to have a vision that, com- it, it, not yours, but mine. You see? And when we get there, uh, you know, we may be doing exactly what we're doing today. Maybe we're doing exactly what God's called us to do today. But I, I know this, that the author of Hebrews seems to say that what faith is to a certain degree is things that are visible and things that are invisible. Things that we already see and some things we don't see. And the truth is that in, in, in God's economy, this may have to do with strangers and foreigners and all different kind of things that we have to just be the people of God in front of and love and take care of them. Uh, does anybody know who Leonard Sweet is? Didn't expect you to, okay? Uh, he's a, a, a theologian, an author, and I just want to read something that he read or wrote in a book. Uh, and the reason I like this book is it's called The Gospel According to Starbucks, okay? And I used to be, I used to be really bad about Starbucks. I quit drinking coffee pretty much because of Starbucks. But, uh, and, and this is what he says, in that book he says faith is not merely a course of study or an an intriguing intellectual pursuit faith is nothing less than the passionate passionate consuming experience of god it is not a set of beliefs or even a lifestyle but a breath and pulse and life itself that's where we're aiming friends to have our faith be everything, everything towards us. Amen.